Our lives are much too brief, she says at 375. If a man is cruel by nature, cruel in action, the mortal world will call down curses on his head while he is alive. And all will mock his memory after death. But then if a man is kind by nature, kind in action, his guests will carry his fame across the earth and people will praise him from the heart. This is interesting because it reminds me, it reminds us of Hamlet's uh, line to his mother I, about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, I must be cruel only to be kind. Uh, her comment is, I have to show you Zania, I, I have to bathe you. Odysseus um, um, says... I'm not interested in a place to sleep. I've slept on the ground for so long. I don't need to worry about a bed. Again, Odysseus and beds uh, are going to play a pivotal role. And he says, I don't want anybody touching my feet either or bathing me unless it's the oldest one you've got. And in fact, Penelope says, we've got just the one, right? And who carefully were told at line 400, I have just an old woman, seasoned wise, who carefully tended my unlucky husband, reared him, took him into her arms the day his mother bore him. Frail as the woman is, she'll wash your feet. Up with you now, she says, my good old Eurycleia. Come and wash your, mast, uh, your masters, equal in, uh, in years. And then she says, Odysseus must have feet and hands like his by now. Hardship can age a person overnight. This, many people have said, is the key that says Penelope knows exactly who this is. Come and bathe him and take care of him. Euryclea immediately weeps because of the mention of Odysseus, and she says, praying always to, re uh, to reach old age and raise his son to glory. Now, she says about Odysseus, he's alone, robbed of his homecoming day, just so the women, she says, must have mocked my king the way these uh, women, these, uh, and, and she calls these, um, these women who have been working here, she calls them also bitches. So we're getting this term used several times to these women. Why? Well, because at the end of our poem, these women will be killed by Odysseus. And I think what Homer's doing is he's saying, these women deserve what ultimately they will get as well, right? Um, she says, I, I want to do this work. The work is mine, 425. Um, uh, Penelope bids me now, and I'm all too glad. I will wash your feet. Now, this reminds us of that the foot washing scene of John 13, for those of us that know our New Testament as well, right? I will wash your feet, both for my own dear queen and for yourself. Your sorrows wring my heart. And why? I listen, uh, or she says, listen to me closely. Mark my words. Many a wayward guess has landed here, but never, I swear, has one so struck my eyes. Your build, your voice, your feet. Um, this, this idea that when you wear sandals, people know you by your feet. You're like Odysseus to the life. And then Odysseus comes back and says, yeah, we bear a striking resemblance to each other as, as you've had the wit to say yourself. Lots of people have said that to me before. But then all of a sudden we've got Odysseus in a moment sitting, sitting full in the firelight. Suddenly at line 440, he swerved around in the dark, gripped by a quick misgiving. Soon as she touched him, she might spot the scar, the truth would all come out. Now, this has obviously been the question throughout the narrative. We know how this thing's going to end. Odysseus is going to come back and he's going to jack all the suitors. We know how it's going to end. So how does Homer build any kind of suspense? This is a brilliant way to do it. We've not yet had the mention of the famous scar. Bending closer, she started to bathe her master. Then, at line 445, in a flash, she knew the scar. And then for the next almost 100 lines, we're going to get a whole story about this scar that's going to tell us amazing things about Odysseus, but it's also going to give us that moment when Euryclea realizes, oh, he's back. And the scar is the one way to prove it. Well, that old one, line 146, made years ago by a boar's white tusk when Odysseus went to Parnassus out to see Autoclus and his sons, his grandfather, the father of Penelope. The man was his mother's noble father, who excelled the world at thievery, that, and subtlety shifty oaths. In other words, Odysseus' grandfather is known to be a crook, to be conniving, to be a man of twists and turns, right? And we're told that when he arrives after the birth of Odysseus, he's the one who says, you must find, a, you must name, give the boy the name I tell you, at line 460, he says, he says, just as I have come from afar, creating pain for many, men and women across the green, good green earth, so let his name be Odysseus. So it will be, in fact, his grandfather who will name him, Autoculus, will name Odysseus as Odysseus, the son of pain, a name he'll earn in full. It's significant 
that Odysseus's scar will remind us that it is in fact his grandfather who said, name him Odysseus, son of pain, son of suffering, one who both gives and receives pain. And if you'll think about it, it's brilliant because every time Odysseus is in the poem acting, he usually is giving pain or receiving pain, often both of them, right? At the, at the very moment he gets the scar, for example, he kills the boar, we're told, right? And the grandfather promises, I'm going to give Odysseus a whole bunch of teammate when he gets old. That's exactly what happens when Odysseus comes of age. He comes to collect his splendid gifts, 470, and off they go to have this fight, uh, this, this hunting uh, thing. In the morning they eat, then they sl uh, uh, first when he arrives they eat, then they sleep, then they go for their hunting in the morning. Off they go with more dogs, and the great boar is, uh, is found, a razorback. Suddenly, stopped at bay, Odysseus rushes at him first with his spear. I'm at line five, uh, uh, 50, uh, 508 or so. But the boar struck faster, lunging in on the slant, a thrust, thrusting, a tusk thrusting up over the boy's knee, gouging a deep strip of flesh, but it never hit the bone, we're told. Odysseus thrust struck, stabbing the beast's right shoulder. Think about how his name, Odysseus, one who gives and causes pain, one who receives pain as well at the same time. This little scene captures all of that, right? And we're told a glint of bronze, the point ripped clear through, and down into the dust the, the boar dropped, grunting out his breath as his life. For those of us that read the, uh, the Iliad together, this is, of course, Iliad language all the way through, the way he kills the boar, right? The sons of his grandfather will then chant spells to heal him, and the old and the young man, we're told, at line 523, will come home filled with joy. His happy parents, his father and noble mother, welcomed him home, asked him of all his exploits, blow by blow, how did he get that wound? He told his tale with style. How the white tusk on the wild boar had gashed his leg, hunting on Parnassus with Autoclius and his sons. Now, this is important because this is what, back to line 40 of this book, this is what Telemachus never got to enjoy coming home and telling his father what I did and how proud I am of myself. Odysseus, of course, is going to learn. In this scene we hear, he told his tale with style. Here, he learns to fight and survive in our story, but he also learns to tell a story with style. And then we're back to it, line 528, that scar. As the old earth cradled his leg, his hands and her hands passed down, she felt it, knew it suddenly, she lets his foot fall, the bronze clangs, tipping over, spilling water, joy and torment. Think about it. Odysseus, his name, giving and receiving pain. Joy and torment gripped her heart at once, tears rushed to her eyes. Voice choked in her throat, she reached for Odysseus's chin and whispered quickly, Yes, yes, you are Odysseus. Oh, dear boy, I couldn't know you before, not till I touched the body of my king. This reminds us of doubting Thomas, doesn't it, in the New Testament, right? When I when I can touch the scar. Um, yes, you're the one, right? She tries to glance at Penelope, but we're told that Penelope has been distracted by Athena. We're then told that Odysseus has his words of caution uh, at, at, four, uh, at 545. He says, nurse, you want to kill me? You suckled me yourself at your own breast, and now I'm home at last after bearing 20 years of brutal hardship, home on native ground, and now you know, now that a god has flashed it in your mind? Quiet! Notice the same thing that he said to Thelemachus. Quiet! Not a word to anyone in the house, or else I warn you, and I mean business too, if a god beats down those brazen suitors in my hands, I will not spare you, my old nurse that you are, when I kill the other women in my house. In other words, he says, if you say a word, I'll kill you. It says a lot about Odysseus, right? Think about being named after his grandpa, who was kind of crafty and conniving, and a one who gives and causes pain. She says back, child, interesting she calls him child because she raised him, right? What nonsense you'll let through your, t through your teeth. You know me. I'm stubborn, never give an inch. I'm, I I'll keep still as a solid rock or iron. In other words, she says, don't worry about it. I will take care of it. The, she says, I'll even report on the other women if you want. He says, Nurse, why bother to count them off? A waste of breath. I'll observe them. Judge each for yourself. Just be quiet. Keep your tails to yourself. Leave the rest to the gods. Hush so, we're told. The old nurse went padding along the halls to fetch more water. We're going to have this thing about spilt water and spilt wine. I told you it's a powerful symbol that's coming. Her basin is spilled, and once she bathed and rubbed him down, 
He hides his scar. Obviously, he doesn't want Penelope to see it. Penelope's final question, she says, Some God has sent me pain that knows no bounds. Very much like Odysseus. She says, um, Anxiety swarm and pierce. I may go mad with grief. And then she even mentions Pandarus' uh, daughter, Adium, who kills her own son accidentally, the Nightingale story. She says, so my wavering heart goes at line 590, shuttling back and forth. This is the challenge for Penelope. And, you, and, and again, there's two ways to read this. One is she knows who she's talking to is Odysseus. And so she's speaking in code language because, uh, again, uh, the, you know, the naughty girl is right there to hear. Or she doesn't, but she just doesn't know what to do. She's totally stuck. That is to say, Penelope is between Scylla and Charybdis in the same way that Odysseus was. Do I stay beside my son? And keep all things secure, my lands, my serving women, the grand high-roofed house, true to my husband's bed, the people's voice as well. Or, do I follow at last the best man who courts me here in the halls who gives the greatest gifts? My son, when he was a boy and lighthearted, urged me not to marry and leave my, father's, my, my husband's house. But now he's grown and reached his young prime. He begs me to leave our palace, travel home, Telemachus, so obsessed with his own estate, the wealth my princely suitors bled away. This is interesting because um, Telemachus doesn't strike us in the poem as being that excited for his mother to marry any of these any of these disgusting guys. Notice when Athena says something about Eurycles being um, possibly given to Penelope being given to him, uh, um, Telemachus was none too pleased. Right? She says, uh, "Then I had this dream, and I want you to help me to interpret this dream." She said, "I had twenty pet geese. An eagle comes along, jacks all the geese." Right, And then um, the eagle um, was able to talk and was able to actually speak and says, I was once the eagle at line 620, but now I'm your husband, back at last, about to launch a terrible fate against all the suitors. By the way, just put it in your notes at 3A. When we meet Plato's Republic later in Book 10, there's going to be a story in the afterlife about how different heroes pick to have another life when they come back. And it'll be interesting to see what Odysseus's choice is, given that in our poem here, he's an eagle. Just put that down. And she asks, what does this mean, this eagle killing all my geese? And he says, twist it however you like. Remember, Odysseus is a man of twists and turns. Your dream can only mean one thing, he says. Odysseus told you himself, he'll make it come to pass. Destruction is clear for each and every suitor. Not a soul escapes his death and doom. She says, oh, my friend, 630. These are lines that Freud loved. Ah, my friend, dreams are hard to unravel. Wayward drifting things, not all we glimpse in them will come to pass. She says, there's two kinds of gates for dreams. There's an ivory one and there's a horn one. This reminding us of Zeus's two jars from the Iliad, as Achilles was telling about it in, in Iliad 23. In other words, how can I know for sure? She says, the day that dawns today, this cursed day will cut me off from Odysseus's house. She's decided, in other words. Now, I mean to announce a contest with those axes, the ones he would often line up here inside the hall, 12 in a straight, unbroken row like blocks to shore. And now, then stand well back and whip an arrow through the lot. Now, I will bring them on as a trial. Like Odysseus's test, Penelope will have a test. And again, if, if Penelope knows she's talking to Odysseus, what she's telling him is, I'm going to figure out a way to get your bow into the hall through a contest, so that way you can, you can kill all these guys. If she doesn't know that it's Odysseus, what she's saying is, I've given up. I've tried everything, and I've given up. There is a third rendering that says, in the same way that she weaved for three years and was able to kind of put them off, she's going to give all these guys a task that she knows none of them can do. Kind of like Hercules and his tasks, he could pull it off. These guys won't be able to pull it off. That is to say, shoot an arrow through 12 axes. He's the man I follow, yes, forsaking this house, where I was once a bride, this gracious house, so filled with the best that life can offer, I shall always remember it. That I know, even in my dreams. Notice she began with dreams and now ends with dreams. Odysseus says, oh, my queen, right? Royal wife of Laertes' son, Odysseus. Now, don't put off this test in the halls a moment. In other words, he says, great idea. If they are speaking in code language, this is Odysseus back to Penelope that says, I love it. Bring my, bring my bow down. Thank you. That's brilliant, right? Before that crew can handle the polished bows, string and taunt, and shoot through all those axes, Odysseus, man of exploits, will be home with you. Penelope says at line 670, six, uh, six, uh, 
I'm now going back to my room upstairs and lie down on my bed, that bed of pain, or back to the bed again, right? That bed of pain, my tears have streaked year in, year out, from the day Odysseus sailed away to sea. Destroy, I call it. That, that's brilliant to me. Destroy, T-R-O-Y. That, that, I hate to say its name, she says. There she says, I'm going to go to rest, rest, and Athena seals her eyes with welcomed sleep. Well, it's a brilliant book on so many levels and so many things are happening. Let's work level two, three quickly. At 2A, think about this one. We are, in some fundamental way, we are our name. When Odysseus is without a name, he's nobody. But now we find out that the name of Odysseus is in fact given to him to mean pain man or suffering man or someone who gives and receives pain. And certainly we've seen that all the way through. How about this one? Knowledge or recognition comes often with fear and pain. Later we'll do Plato's Republic and we'll do Plato's uh, uh, cave allegory in Republic 7. And Plato's pedagogy, as we call it, the only way you'll ever learn anything really important is through fear and pain. We'll get there. How about this one? It's hard to grow up, right? It's hard to get your scars, if you will. And those scars define, in many ways, who you are. At 2B, the symbolism, well, we're mentioning the scar, so obviously the scar and the name are somehow connected together, aren't they? And they tell us a lot about the differences between Odysseus as young, as young lad and Telemachus as young lad. The irony, of course, is the scar and, of course, how Odysseus responds to Euryclea when she sees the scar. He says, I'll kill you if you say a word. She's like, no, no, I'm not going to say anything. Odysseus, of course, the irony is that Odysseus is with Penelope, but of course we want to know, is it, does she know, does she not know? At level 3A, let's work quickly with the Iliad, think about this one, Iliad 19 is where Achilles prepares for battle. Think about this, Achilles has a wound that in his heel that will kill, kill him. Odysseus has a wound that he survives, and that scar starts to represent, of course, his ability to survive. What's another text where recognition comes through some kind of physical mark? I, I mentioned the story about doubting Thomas with, with Christ after uh, his resurrection in the New Testament. What is another text for you where a physical mark is, is a foundational to identification of who an individual is? Shakespeare, of course, loves this kind of thing, right? The idea of the hidden hero in Hamlet, or, for example, in King Lear, we have both Edgar and Kent who will disguise themselves It's compelling. Think about how Arthur has to grow up in a moment. One moment he's a child, the next moment he pulls the sword from the stone. And think about how that relates to Telemachus, who one moment is a kid, and the next moment he's told by Athena it's time to grow up. And he goes away and gets information and comes back and his dad tells him, I'm your father, now let's go kill a bunch of suitors. And as they're putting away the weapons, storing the weapons, Athena is helping and Telemachus is blown away and all dad says is, shut up and do your job and go to bed. Telemachus having to grow up quickly. Finally, at 3B, you knew this one was coming, so we'll ask it. What is the scar that defines you, that identifies you as you? Might be physical, most likely it's not. Does it have a history, though, this scar? And did it involve fear and pain, this scar? What was the time, another 3B question, what was the time you had to be cruel only to be kind? Odysseus is clearly cruel. We're going to see this again when he meets his father. He's clearly cruel. He's even cruel when he meets Euryclea and he says to her, right, with his hand around her throat, I'll crush your throat and kill you if you, if you give it away. What was the time you had to be cruel to be kind? Or what was the time somebody else had to be cruel to be kind to you? And you only understood it after the fact, right? You only understood it. All right, now we turn from book 19 to book 20. Odysseus' is spying will continue in book 20. We're going to get all kinds of signs. I mean, these guys obviously have to be painfully stupid to not figure out something is about to happen. But then again, for three years, they let Penelope unweave what she was weaving. So obviously they're not the brightest crowns in the, in the box, are they, right? The ironies will begin to mount as we head again towards book 22. Let's turn now to book 20, and we'll enjoy more kinds of ironies from a wonderful text of ironies. Thank you.